All righty. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this event, Backyard Forestry, November 2024. Tonight's event is Meet the Author with Ethan Tapper. I call him a celebrity forester. And a lot of folks have been calling me about that and saying, you have a celebrity forester, huh? And I said, yeah, we do. And so Ethan has written a book. I have one copy in my hand, which uh, if you stay through the end, we're going to be giving one away. So uh, please stay tuned. Uh, he also refers to himself as a forester, an author, and a digital creator, and he'll explain all of that, I'm sure, this evening. I uh, want to give a shout out to the folks who did last month's BYF, Betsy McShane from NRCS, Mike Zaldos from the Forest Service, and John Hooven from Cape Atlantic. And they did a great job. And not only did they do a great job live, but their video has had, I believe, the most views of any video we've had so far. So they must have a lot of followers. And so I thank them for getting the word out on their own presentations. And uh, people are really starting to get very interested in what we're doing. Uh, next month, we have a program that's a little bit interest different and presented in an interesting format. It, uh, we're bringing together uh, conservancy organizations, the Nature Conservancy, the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, and the American Farmland Trust. And they're going to be speaking about conservation of forest lands and farms in New Jersey and how the process works. They're going to unbundle the process for everyone so they'll understand what does it mean when something's preserved? Is it an easement? Is it a transfer? Who maintains it? And how the process works, how long it takes. So if you own property or you live next door to a forest property and it's going into conservation, you wanna learn about what that means or you just care about the forest in New Jersey, this is a great event to attend and uh, we'll be putting up the registration in a day or two. This is a big one, save the date. Andy Bennett is, a, uh, is the uh, extraordinaire manager of uh, annual meetings and he is uh, right there on the screen and our 50th annual meeting, that's a big number for us. And I think this is Ethan's 50th book tour visit. So everything lined up. So that means you have to attend our annual meeting. Registration will be open on our website in December. It's very easy to register and uh, we'd really love to have you there. Um, I told you a little bit about our YouTube page. Go there and check it out and you'll find everything we've done for the past few years. Uh, rather than going through a list of things that we do as an organization tonight, I'm going to go straight to one subject, which is we're about to launch our membership drive for 2025. So if you've been enjoying these presentations regularly or once in a while, uh, and you want to do something really good for us to help us keep doing them, join the New Jersey Forestry Association. It's also very easy to do, and you can do it right on our website right away after this meeting. We can, you can go right there and join and uh, it accepts PayPal and any credit card. And so please, please consider doing that. Uh, last but not least, uh, we uh, have to have a legal disclaimer because we have a variety of presenters, some of them who present on legal issues and technical issues where uh, there are things involved that we have to explain to people. We're just giving you information. We are not making representations or promises about what anybody says. And if you wanna do any of the things that you hear from the presenters, consult your own professionals and advisors. And with that, uh, we're going to meet the author and Andy Bennett is going to give us an intro on Ethan because he knows Ethan pretty well. So I'm gonna stop this share and there you are, Andy. Rock and roll. Okay, folks, thanks so much for coming. Uh, it's going to be a fun night. So I'll do a quick little intro on Ethan here. Some of this I stole from your website, Ethan. So hopefully it it, uh, it goes good here. So Ethan's a forester. We already talked about that. He's an author, obviously, and a digital creator. Lives up in Vermont. He owns a about 175 acre woodlot in Vermont that he refers to as Bear Island. Um, after working as a county forester for about eight years in Vermont, he uh, stepped down from that role to start his own consulting business, which he calls Bear Island Forestry. Uh, and this year, he published his first book, which he's going to present on tonight. Um, it's called How to Love a Forest, 
the bittersweet work of tending a changing world. Um, Ethan's a friend to me. He's a friend to our association. Uh, some of you may know this, but in 2023 at our annual meeting, Ethan was our uh, keynote speaker. And just a quick plug for our YouTube channel. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can watch that presentation, which was outstanding. So so with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Ethan. Ethan, thanks again for, for coming and uh, talking to everybody. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Uh, hey, hey everybody, I'm Ethan. Um, and it's such a pleasure and such a privilege to get to be here talking to you about this thing. Who'd have thunk it? You know, just some just some forester from Vermont and somehow got it together to write this book. Um, it's been such a cool and surreal experience to get to tour all around the Northeast these last few months and to talk about it. And, you know, I still feel like a little bit, you know, I'm in these bookstores and libraries and of course we're like surrounded by all these books, but still I feel like uh, writing a book is something that like other people do. It doesn't seem like something that, that I could ever do. And the way that this happened is just that I had some stuff I wanted to talk about and uh, didn't know how to write a book, never done anything like that before. And, you know, I just started to, to write every day, first thing in the morning for an hour. That's what really happened was I figured out that the time when my brain is the most productive and creative for writing is five to six a.m. first hour that I'm awake, and so for six years, I just was like type, type, type five to six a.m. six o'clock, close the laptop, go work in the woods. And it's a funny thing because I think that if I had like tried to go out and write a book, I never would have even gotten started. It would have it would have been too much. It would have been too intimidating, too scary. But what I could do was write for an hour. I can write for an hour, you know? And uh, it's one of these things, and there's actually a lot of parallels between my book and what has been over the last seven years, my work on my land, Bear Island, which I'll talk about more in detail in a little bit, uh, where, you know, it's too much. Sometimes it's too much to like do the whole thing. So what you do is you just do what you can, you know? and in the case of the book, every day, right for an hour. In the case of Bear Island, every day that I could, I just do something to try and help this forest, which when I got to it was like the most degraded forest I'd ever seen, um, try to make it healthy again in some small way. And what it felt like I was doing was every day, stepping off my porch and taking like a little stone and tossing it back there. You know, it's a gesture that by itself is meaningless and completely insignificant. And then six years later for the book, seven years later for this land, you look back there and, and there's a big pile of stones. And you're like, geez, I couldn't have made all that. Um, but I did. And it's just so surreal to see it now in place. And of course, so it took me six years to write the book. Then I was like, signed with the publisher. And I was like, this thing's gonna be out in a couple of weeks. And uh, they said, your publication date's in two years. So here we are many years later, and it's just such a joy to get to share this message with you all. And, you know, so it was mentioned that I do a few different things. Um, I'm really a consulting forester, but then I've also really gotten into uh, doing communication work and like reaching out and trying to explain this really complicated and nuanced world of forest stewardship. And I do that with like public events and some other consulting work with, with government agencies and NGOs and with these social media channels, which has been amazing over the last year to see how much my channels on Instagram, TikTok and YouTube and Facebook taken off. And, you know, it's just a whole nother way that we can reach people, which is just such a beautiful thing and to share these important messages. Uh, but what really inspired me to start writing the book in the first place, which is, you know, this whole other part of how I'm trying to reach out to people is that uh, I was seeing a few different things as a forester. You know, there's there's something that happens when you become a forester or when you enter into deep relationship with these ecosystems, which is that suddenly uh, you see them as they really are. And, and you see these nuances about them that for many people, you know, we go into these ecosystems and they seem beautiful, pristine and perfect. Uh, for many people, they go unnoticed. So, you know, I started my journey as someone who just wanted to 
take care of forests and I any, anybody who did anything to them like a cut a tree or anything like that I felt like they were bad person or they were doing the wrong thing and and then when I learned about where our forests are actually at and where they're actually headed uh it suddenly started to seem like to to do nothing in many cases was not going to be enough to help them recover from these wounds of the past to help them survive this moment and to move into this future is really uncertain uh, with grace. And what I really noticed was, you know, and I led hundreds of public walks as a service forester uh, for eight years and, you know, attended by thousands of people. I walked on hundreds of different people's forests and really noticed these interesting, you know, things in, in the public perception, this dichotomy where I feel like for a lot of folks that that care about forests and that love forests, the perception was that, you know, we've messed them up in the past. We've caused all these problems that they're dealing with now. And so the only act of care and compassion for these ecosystems is to leave them alone. And then, you know, the perception of people who maybe are cutting trees, or killing deer, or doing something like that, is that they just don't care. And this dichotomy it doesn't really exist. And I've, I've found that out firsthand, that in some cases, love in a forest might mean leave it in, leaving it alone. And in some cases, doing these bittersweet acts, like cutting a tree, like killing a deer, all of these incredibly nuanced things that we need to do to help our forest in this moment can be like the most profound acts of care and compassion that we can offer, even if they're things that feel really hard. And I would argue, especially if they're things that feel like they're really hard. So I'm going to do a couple of readings tonight. And I'm going to talk for, we'll I'll talk for like 35, 40 minutes. And then uh, if questions come up, throw them in the chat. And I'll do a Q&A afterwards. So this is from the introduction of the book, which sort of talks about why I wanted to write the book in the first place. Once it seemed that there were only two paths to follow. A status quo that saw forests and other ecosystems as commodities, and an opposing force that sought to protect ecosystems from ourselves, to leave them alone. As forests everywhere struggle under the weight of the many threats and the stressors of the modern world, as they suffer the legacies of the past and confront a future that promises challenges like never before, I have realized that neither of these two paths is enough. I have realized that the world needs action intertwined with compassion, relationship imbued with responsibility, death infused with life. I have gone my own way, fostering a divergent vision, a reimagining of what it means to love a forest, engaging in the radical act of trading simplicity for complexity, trading a tidy vision for one that is true. My journey toward these realizations has been long and lonely and sinuous. In my little house at the foot of the mountain, my bookshelf is crowded with books about trees and plants and animals, birds and bears and fungi, the relationship between people and ecosystems and the threats both face. Never have I found a book that has articulated what a forest truly is, not just its botany and its biology, the contours of its many pieces and its parts, but how this entire living community moves and behaves and changes. Never have I found a book that described what it means to care for a forest like Bear Island, an ecosystem that has been changed and degraded and depleted and left to suffer alone. Never have I found a book that described the pain and the joy and the anxiety of trying to love and protect an ecosystem of guiding it toward wholeness at this strange and crucial moment in time. No book has prepared me for the many complex and bittersweet choices that I would someday make at Bear Island or for the fact that these actions would be celebrations, the substance of a truly radical and responsible relationship with the forest. In this book, I draw these disparate threads together exploring what it means to love a forest in this changed and changing world. It is a new land ethic, a vision of relationship and responsibility, freedom and power, resilience and humility, 
legacy, beauty, and change. In a world that is both human and wild, both wounded and vibrant, both suppressed and emergent, this is a vision both for how we manage forests and take care of ecosystems and how we manage ourselves, how we take care of each other. So there's a piece of this too, you know, a piece of this is definitely like, we rely on these ecosystems. We rely on them physically. We literally can't live without them, right? And they're in trouble, you know? And uh, they give us so many amazing things which are also at risk, right? They support our lives ecologically, economically, culturally in so many ways. And so in many ways, you know, by thinking about our forests in a little bit more of a complex way, not just, you know, how do we protect them from ourselves, but how do we actually like help them in this moment when they need so much help is really, really important. I think that a good term for us all to know is this, this term global change. A lot of times when we think, when folks think about forests, they're really focused on climate change. You know, and sometimes that can be a reason that, that people cite for like not managing forests. Um, the problem is that that just climate change alone doesn't represent the full scope of the different things that these ecosystems face, right? So what global change is, is a term that includes climate change and all of the different symptoms of that. So things like shifting disturbance regimes, extreme weather, uh, drought, inundation, uh, storms of increased severity and frequency, things like that. And also non-native invasive plants, animals, pests and pathogens, biodiversity loss, deer overpopulation, forest fragmentation, deforestation, pollution, and more, which together comprise really the sum total of the things that we need to deal with. And as we deal with all of those things at once, it means that we have to make compromises. We can't, you know, just like try to maximize one thing and ignore all that other stuff, because if we do, our forests and other ecosystems are not going to be okay. And all the species that rely on them, ourselves included, are not going to be okay. So it's important that we think about these things in terms not just of climate change, but of this global change. And there's another element to this, and I just have a super quick reading about this as well. And uh, I hope you like vocabulary. <laughs> I don't have a lot of vocabulary, but in this book, but, um, or complex, like, you know, scary vocabulary. But uh, I do like these sort of weird uh, vocab words. And one of my favorite forestry vocab words is the structure by which a fir needle attaches to a twig, which is called a suborbicular leaf cushion. That's a good one. There's another one, the American basswood, uh, the fruiting structure of the American basswood is called a cluster of nutlets subtended by a leafy bract. Here's another vocab word for you. Forests are socio-ecological systems. Our lives are forever stitched into the green flesh of the biosphere. The separation of the human world from the wild world is an illusion. We cannot care for ecosystems without recognizing that we will always rely on them and we will always tax them. That human life will always be precious and worth nourishing and will always come at a cost. We cannot choose if we will impact ecosystems, if we will impact peoples across the globe, if we will impact the lives of future generations. We can only choose what that impact will be. So in this, you know, murky stew of different things that we need to think about, it's not just about how we care for ecosystems, because when we're thinking about the solutions to that problem, we also can't forget that like we live here and we also want to live in these societies where we have access and opportunity and all of these other things. We want to be able to hand future generations of people a world that is more functional and beautiful and filled with opportunity, right? So that's another thing that we need to put in that pot, right? We need to think about how do we build a world that works not just for these ecosystems, but also for its people and incorporate 
you know, some of these terms from like the social world, which usually it's, we think about it as like, here's the human world and here's ecosystems. They are interrelated. You know, it's, they, they are, and we can recognize that uh, or we can ignore it. And if we ignore it, we will miss out on the ability to really understand the world that we're trying to build, which is one that works for all of its ecosystems and all of its people. And there are compromises inherent in that as well. So a little bit about me. Uh, it's funny when, when I do these interviews and get to do these presentations and readings and stuff, because, you know, over the course of the last two months since the book has come, come out, I've had to like, like a superhero, define what my origin story is. So, you know, people want to know, like, how did, how did I end up being a forester? How did I end up writing this book and all this other stuff? And it's been kind of fun because I get to go back and look at all these like random things that I did and realize how every one of those things, you know, added up, led to, led me to the place where I am now. Um, and it's really, really, um, yeah, it's really been a journey. And this is, this is what it was as best as I can figure it. So I grew up in this little town, this little village called Saxton's River in southeastern Vermont, 300 people surrounded by forests. And when you hear these origin stories of like famous nature writers and biologists and ecologists, they're always like, I was like a nature kid, you know? And I was like crawling around the dirt, looking at bugs and catching frogs and tracking deer. And I was out in the woods all the time and I just loved it. And that wasn't my experience at all. I, I do not remember caring about forests really, uh, you know, and was sort of, we, we would play in them and do stuff in them just because they were just all around us. But I didn't care about them specifically at all or think that I would ever work in them. And uh, what I do remember very clearly is that I wanted to get out of there bad. And when I was a junior in high school, I remember saying to somebody, I don't know where I'm going to school or to college, uh, but I know where I'm not going to go. And that's the University of Vermont because everybody goes there and I'm getting out of here. And the first month of my senior year of high school, I got a letter from the University of Vermont that told me I got this scholarship called the Green and Gold Scholarship, which was a full scholarship. And I was like, yes, I'm going to the University of Vermont. You know, no integrity, no principles. I was like, all right, I guess we'll just do that. And uh, even when I got there, though, I didn't know what I wanted to study. And I was just taking kind of random courses and whatever. Interestingly, as I was finishing up my second semester of college, my like high school girlfriend who was still with, first big love of my life, was coming back. And she had done this like wilderness program, this five-month expedition. And when she came back, she had had this huge, life-changing, impactful experience. And I had not. I'd just been like hanging out in my dorm room or whatever. Uh, and we weren't connecting. And I was afraid that we were going to break up. And so I did, you know, what any perfectly rational 18-year-old would do. And I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going on a wilderness expedition. And the next one left in two weeks. And it was a six-month expedition where we skied north for three months and then we built a canoe and canoed back down. Now, in retrospect, I did this for no reason. Relationship didn't work out, but of course it, it totally changed the course of my life. And then after that, all I wanted to do was just be in the woods. And I worked as a wilderness guide. I lived like in this uninsulated yurt with a fur bow floor in the woods of Maine for a year. I worked with draft animals, uh, uh, did a little bit of work with draft horse loggers. And, and then I got a letter from the University of Vermont that told me that I had to come back or I was going to lose my scholarship. And so I remember sitting on the bow floor of my year and holding a paper list, of all the majors at the University of Vermont. And I scrolled down, I saw forestry and I didn't know what it was, but I knew that it had the word forest in it. And so I said, I guess we'll try that. And of course it ended up being a really good fit. And, you know, forestry is so special, you guys. And uh, there's a bunch of things that I think are really special about it. One thing that's unique is that, you know, when, you, when you're in this world and you're studying these environmental sciences, natural sciences, whatever you want to call them, there's all these like sub-disciplines, all these little tracks. 
right? So you can be like a botanist and you can study plants. Or you could be an ornithologist and you can study birds. You could be a geologist, look at rocks, you know, and you can be a, a myrmacologist and look at ants and a mycologist and look at fungi. And with foresters, you're sort of responsible for all of that stuff, but for none of it in particular. You're responsible for that ecosystem. And so you have to know a little bit about botany and wildlife biology, ornithology, soil science, geology, hydrology, all of these different pieces that combine to describe what a forest is. And so you start to see, you know, these ecosystems not based on one little piece of them, but on this whole expansive community that not only makes forests beautiful and amazing, but also makes them functional. You start to see that things like biodiversity, which I think sometimes we we mistake as being something that's like nice to have. You know, isn't it nice that we can go there and see a yellow warbler or whatever? Uh, and is actually essential to the function of these ecosystems. And you start to see how the relationship between all these pieces and parts and these you know, incredibly nuanced and complex relationships are what define these ecosystems. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And, and it's really fascinating you know, to, to go to all these different classes and to then really get to put together these pieces and start to see how you're responsible for this entire system. Now, there's an interesting thing, like in walking in the woods with thousands of people, uh, when I do these presentations or when I do these walks, a lot of times I'll ask this question, which we all know the answer to, which is what's a forest, right? And every one of you, if I asked you that question, uh, would be like, yeah, I know what that is. It's, you know, it's an area with a bunch of trees and I know it when I see it, but if I pressed you on it, you would crumble because uh, we really don't know that much about them, most of us, beyond that they're like an area with a bunch of trees, right? And they are much more than that. So a definition that I like a little better is this definition for what we call a natural community, which is just a different way of describing and categorizing our ecosystems from this book called Wetland, Woodland, Wildland which is actually about the natural communities of Vermont. And they describe a natural community as, quote, an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment, and the natural processes that affect them. So what I like about this is that it expands what a forest is. So it's not just those trees. It's all of those living components of that ecosystem. So it's the trees and the plants and the animals, birds and the bears and the fungi and all that stuff. And it's also where those things physically are you know, including some of the components of that ecosystem that we would typically think of as abiotic or non-living components, things like soils and waters. Uh, and it is also even the natural processes that change those things over time. So, you know, it's it, it massively expands what the forest is. And by extension, what it means to care for it. Because suddenly it's not our job to care for a bunch of trees, right? It's our job to care for this ecosystem. And, and in fact, to care for that entire ecosystem, those living things, those non-living things, those natural processes, in some cases will require doing things like cutting trees, right? Which is not the loss of what that forest is, it's how we take care of that whole thing, right? In the midst of all of these things that they face. And so I started to see what I would call the beauty of action and, and started to see where our forests really were and that you know these beautiful forests that I've been wandering through as a guide and living in in Maine and all these other things, that they were actually not okay. You know, that they were dealing with these profound legacies of the past that changed them, transformed them into something that actually bore little resemblance to what forests had been on our landscape for thousands of years. And that we're dealing with all of these threats and stressors that I mentioned, all those things of global change, and that we're heading into this future that promised challenges like never before. And it started to seem uh, less and less like an act of compassion to just always leave them alone. And this is the thing that's also really special about forestry, which is that at its heart, it's a discipline of action. 
So imbued in us is this idea that we do not have to be bystanders in these ecosystems, that we can go into them and we can see what's going on and then we can do something about it. And something that I'll say like a little cheekily to my colleagues that are of these other disciplines is I'll say, you know, if you want to know every little insect that's in your forest, call an entomologist. And if you want to know every bird, call an ornithologist. And if you want to know every plant, call a botanist. And if you want to do anything about any of that stuff, you call a forester. And so it sort of thrust me into this idea, which I believe is true, that we can have a relationship with these ecosystems, which is active and pragmatic and profoundly positive, that we can actually be a keystone species in these ecosystems, a species that creates habitat for so many others, a species that uses this power that we have uh, to do so much good. And so after leaving forestry school, um, I got a job with a smaller consulting forestry company in central Vermont, I worked there for a few years and then took this job as the Chittenden County Forester. So that's a service forester covering Chittenden County. And I did that for eight years. And then, you know, as Andy mentioned, left to start my own business in June. And it, it was just a really cool thing to be a service forester because I also got to do something that I didn't know that I like to do, which is to talk about this stuff. And I think in our forestry community, I'm a little bit of a unicorn because uh, many of us who do forestry, we want to just go out there and, and be in the woods and be quiet and, you know, do this good work. And uh, I like talking to people. I like doing the doing that work alone as well. But I was really realizing that in absence of, you know, really explaining this this work we do, which let's be real about it, you know, forest management is at times really counterintuitive, at times jarring, and for many people, very confusing. I mean, who could ever think that to cut a tree could be something that's good for a forest? I mean, that's completely reasonable. Um, and if we don't talk about it and explain the nuanced work that we do, people aren't going to understand it because we didn't give them the tools to understand the stuff that we're doing, right? And so I started to really get into to doing that. And uh, it was just such a fun, a fun thing to work with other people on their lands and to encounter all these forests that have all this variability that are facing all of these, these profound challenges. And uh, the biggest learning experience that I had during that time though, was when I became the owner of this piece of land that I now call Bear Island. And so when I first heard about Bear Island, my buddy was like, hey, do you see that? You see that piece of land for sale? Uh, 175 acres and I hadn't and we looked it up on this real real estate website and all that there was was a picture of this one mountain called Camel Sump which has this very distinctive shape as if to say you know forget all, all about that forest just build your mansion here and you'll be able to look at Camel Sump and you know it was pretty cheap and I was like geez what's wrong with it and so I went there and to go give it a look and my first impression was that uh, the the access road, the, the truck road, hadn't been properly stabilized. There was a ravine cutting right down the center. I had to like straddle it with the wheels of my truck. Got up onto the log landing, this, that clearing where that picture had been taken from, and it was covered in trash. Bags of household trash, busted pieces of equipment partially buried in the earth, hydraulic hoses and cables, hydraulic buckets, tires, uh, and going out from it in every direction, these skid skid roads, logging roads, uh, with these three foot deep ruts, just wash in murky water down the mountain. And it was not a very good way to start, but I was like, you know, I'm here, let's go check it out. And so I started to take a walk and I walked up that main trail and it was really, really steep. I was getting covered in sweat, picking ticks off myself. And I was walking and walking. And as I was walking, I realized that something was bothering me. I couldn't put my finger on what it was. And, you know, I kept on trying to think, what's wrong, you know? And what I realized after walking for about an hour was that there were no healthy trees there. Every tree that I saw was declining, dying, diseased. 
And once I started realizing that it was actually really jarring because I kept on going around and I was like, where are the healthy trees? Where are the healthy trees? So what I learned is that 30 years before, uh, been owned by this timber company and, and they just told these loggers, no forester involved or anything like that. They just said, go cut every tree bigger than 10 inches in diameter on the mountain. And what this was, was it's a process, an unethical process. It's not forest management. Um, it's probably closer to mining because it's purely extractive practice, what we call high grading, which is where you go into the forest and you cut all of the most valuable high grade trees and you leave all the least valuable low grade trees standing there. And uh, the problem is those high grade trees are the healthiest trees in the forest. So what you've done is the opposite that any of us ethical foresters would ever do. Uh, which is we would always be trying to make that forest healthier and more diverse and more complex over time. And they had managed it to be less healthy. Actually, if they had been like, we want to manage this to be less healthy, uh, it would have been hard to do. And it's so ridiculous and so such a weird way to think about managing a forest. You know, if you ever thought about future generations or any had any responsibility toward that ecosystem at all, that I say it's like if, you went into your vegetable garden in the middle of summer and you weeded out all the vegetables. That's what this forest felt like. Uh, and I think there's an argument to be made that it would have been a greater kindness to this forest if they just cut all the trees. And then at least there would have been enough light for a new generation of trees to regenerate that had a chance of being healthy. As it was, you know, they just picked out all the healthiest trees and then those unhealthy trees closed their canopies and there we were. As I was walking, I saw that there were some places where the forest was actually trying to regenerate and all those little trees were getting browsed by deer. There's evidence of deer overpopulation as well. I slid down over these cliffs that bisect the land from west to east and right into this dense, dense population of this non-native invasive plant called Japanese barberry. 30 acres, pure, three foot high, no native plants. And, you know, when you've dealt with those plants long enough, you know that uh, a forest with, with non-native and plant, invasive plants like that doesn't have a future. That the trees, you know, as they invariably decline and die, uh, will be replaced by nothing but barberry and no native species will ever live there. So it's very bleak. So anyway, I was pushing through that stuff, got back to my truck, and I was like, forget this place. And I left. Well, sure enough, I started to think about it more and more and kind of crane my neck to look at it as I passed it on the highway and to wonder if that was a place that actually uh, didn't have any hope or if there were things that I could do to help it. A couple months later, I went back and walked it again and, and I started to find all these little beacons of hope. So I started to find that there were, uh, that there were plants that I loved, things like sweet fern, low bush blueberry, maple leaf viburnum, pink corydalis, red columbine. Uh, I started to find that there were actually some healthy trees there after all, that they were just so hidden behind these masses of unhealthy trees, I hadn't seen them. And I found all these cool rock outcrops covered in reindeer moss with these sweeping views of the Winooski River Valley. And I was standing on one of those outcrops when I said to myself, I'm gonna try and buy this place. I didn't know how to do that, never done anything like that before. And so I called up my old boss, Mike, uh, who sold forest land real estate. And I said, Mike, there's this piece of land and I want to put an offer. How do I put an offer in and, and how much should I offer? And he said, well, let me ask you a few questions about it. Uh, does it have any timber on it? And I said, no. And he was like, uh, any real estate potential? I said, no. Uh, is the access good? No. Could it be a sugar bush? No. And we kept on going down the line. He was going to ask me something. I'd be like, no, no, no. And eventually he said, Ethan, this place sounds terrible. Just offer them like nothing. And don't be afraid of hurting their feelings. And so that's how I became the owner of this piece of land, Bear Island. And, you know, it was such a, it ended up being such a catalyzing place as I, you know, sort of went to articulate some of these ideas, you know, that informed my personal land ethic and that found their way into this book, How to Love a Forest. Because it's one thing, you know, to believe that 
All we need to do to protect forests is to protect them from ourselves. Just hold them over here and then nature will take care of everything and everything's gonna be fine. And it's quite another thing when you're standing on that log landing surrounded by trash, you know, and in a forest with no healthy trees and watching thousands of years of soil roll down those skitter ruts, knowing that down the hill, there's 30 acres of a forest without a future. And, uh, and you have to ask yourself, if it would be a greater kindness to this forest to leave it alone or to do everything in our power to help make it healthy again. You know, and as it happened, uh, the tools that were necessary to do this were, you know, were not easy. And I have a couple superpowers that have helped me in this journey. Uh, one of them is that I am not a purist. And so I asked myself, radically what is necessary to help this forest be healthy again you know and and what tools do we have and what technology do we have to help this forest and so over the last seven years it's been a journey to bring those things to bear and to make that this forest bear island uh, healthy again and so i you know have taught myself to run excavator every year i run an excavator for a week and stabilize those old skid trails and build new, more resilient skid trails. Uh, taught myself to run a skidder, came better with a chainsaw, taught myself to be a hunter and all of these different things and just started to work away and to address these problems as much as I could. Uh, I found every healthy tree and released it from competition, cutting less healthy trees that were competing with them. And in areas where there were no healthy trees, I cut all the trees, killed dozens of deer, I killed all those non-native plants with herbicide. And all of those things, and that last one was the trickiest for me to get my head around, um, as it might be for you. All of those things were incredibly hard to do. And all of those things were completely necessary to help this forest in its healing journey. And there is a parody that I like, which is that I know that 30 years ago, loggers came to my forest and you know, they use these tools, these chainsaws, these skidders, probably skidders are just a piece of logging equipment. We call them cable skidders. They have a cable winch on the back. Probably these, these cable skidders made by this company, Timberjack, like in the late 70s, early 80s. And I know because I've dug pieces of them out of the ground with the excavator, uh, you know, and created all these problems that I'm going to spend the rest of my life fixing. And in Healing Bear Island, two of my most powerful tools are my chainsaw and my 1981 Timberjack cable skitter. There's a million things like this, including many of the things that I named that used in one way can harm these ecosystems and used in another way can help them heal. And there's another thing like that, which is us. You know, we are not doomed to degrade and destroy these ecosystems. We can change. And in fact, a lot of the work that's being done in our forests right now by people like folks involved in the New Jersey Forestry Association is in keeping with that, that we have, you know, listened to what's going on in our ecosystems and that we're trying to forge a relationship with them that is better, you know, and that is actually helping the forest heal from short-sighted practices of the past, you know, that is helping forests heal from the many things that they're facing in this moment. And it's just a tricky thing about this world, this, this forest stewardship thing, that the tools that we have are hard to understand. And they just are. And they're bittersweet. You know, I don't ever want to feel like when I cut a tree, that it's nothing. Or when I kill a deer, that it's nothing. I always want to feel like that's a really big deal. I always want that to be a little heartbreak, you know? And and that will tell me that I know that I'm doing it in the right way, right? And that I'm, I'm approaching it with the seriousness and the gravity that it deserves. And that's what many of our land stewards and our conservation organizations are doing right now, even if they're doing stuff that maybe you don't quite understand, right? And they would love to tell you about it. Um, so one of the things that I think about a lot is like, you know, if, if we, I don't, I'm not a parent. But I would imagine that anyone on this call, if you had a child, right, and that child was sick, 
and they needed some medicine or a treatment. And maybe that was a treatment that for some reason you didn't agree with, you didn't like, that you said you'd never do. Uh, but that's what they needed to be healthy again. Wouldn't you do it anyway? Any of us would, right? And I don't know why it feels like we can't afford our forest that same level of dignity to do those incredibly uncomfortable things to protect these ecosystems that are so precious. So I wanna do one more reading and then I'll take your questions. Um, you know, something that's been really interesting about this process of healing Bear Island is that, you know, when I got there, I was like, this place, this land, Bear Island is like perfect for this moment. It's got every problem that a forest could have, right? You know, and, and it's the perfect forest for this moment we call the Anthropocene, the age of humans, a geologic epoch defined by human activity. And now when I walk on these trails and, you know, walk through these forests, with friends and colleagues, they're like, oh, this is a nice diverse complex forest. And I have to tell them, I say, I swear to you, if you had walked here with me seven years ago, you would have said, this is the most messed up forest I've ever seen in my life. You know, and, and all of those changes were accomplished, not just by leaving it alone, but by radically taking action, right? Um, and the other thing that I've seen too, is that I think in, when we think about like how we're caring for this world, uh, a lot of times we think about mitigation, right? Like, you know what? Let's just stop the bleeding, right? And and our, our loftiest goal is how do we just leave future generations a world that isn't any worse than it is right now? You know, this is like, this is, this is what we're like, oh yeah, our, our dream of dreams, right? Uh, and I'm not interested in that at all. And what I've seen at Bear Island is that not just this ecosystem that has been turned back from the brink of collapse, but one that has become many new things, right? That has become diverse and complex that is offering habitats to so many more living things, dozens of species of forest birds, countless thousands of species of invertebrates, dozens of species of forest trees, hundreds of species of herbaceous plants, right? And, and I realized that the work I've done is not just mitigation, it's generation, regeneration. And this is the opportunity that we have in this moment, right? This is something that, not just that we have to do, but something that we get to do. And if we're willing to do these things that are hard and we're willing to cut these trees, you know, in New Jersey, maybe we're willing to, to, uh, to do these burns, right? To use fire as a tool, which is also, by the way, incredibly important ecological force in these ecosystems. Um, if we're willing to kill these deer, if we're willing to kill these non-native invasive plants, we cannot just stop the bleeding, but we can build a world that is so much more full of life and so much more abundant and is so much more of a greater gift to future generations of people. And I want to read a, the last chapter in the book, which is about that. Not the whole last chapter, but part of it. Um, this is a little bit of a longer reading. And then, like I said, be happy to take your questions. The storm clouds stamp their feet. They are corralled along the shifting path of the big river, thundering between the walls of the broad valley. The clouds move west, driven like cattle toward the mountains. As empty as it often feels, there is something beautiful about a life lived in the aftermath. Here, in the junkyard of the Anthropocene, we hold the fate of the world, all of its ecosystems, all of its peoples in our hands. In this moment, we can allow this biosphere, our home, to sink further into dysfunction and disarray, or we can make the radical and bittersweet decisions necessary to choose a different path. Inside of this catalyzing moment, we have the opportunity to reimagine our relationship to ecosystems and our relationship to each other, to redefine what we are and what is precious to us. As empty as they often feel, there is something beautiful about a landscape of forests that are just a fraction of their true potential. 
The forests of our lives are still only at the beginning of their journeys. They may yet become diverse and complex, rich with legacies, ancient again. With our help, these forests may rediscover a capacity for life beyond imagining, an abundance that this world has not known for generations. I pick up another acorn, another product of thousands of years of adaptation and change, another precious thing chained to the legacies of the past and hurtling toward an uncertain future. Perhaps it is doomed. Perhaps it contains endless possibilities. Humidity cloaks the land, drawing tiny round beads of sweat from my skin. For a moment, the mountain is cast in golden light. It smells sharp and strong. As I touch another acorn, a raindrop strikes the back of my hand, rolling between the small bones of my fingers. Suddenly, droplets are stippling the soil like falling stars, throwing up little clouds of dust. I have nowhere to be, and so I kneel, watching the water run around the stumps and the upturned leaves, drawing spider webs on the earth. Someday I will tell my children that the caves and the talus above are a womb, the origin of all the black bears on the mountain, and that the springs in the big bowl are the source of all of its waters. Someday I will walk these trails with my children and teach them to reimagine forest as communities of complexity and depth and expansiveness, communities that are fated to change to celebrate both the miracle of life and the miracle of death. Someday I will kneel beside these stumps, a young forest blooming around me, and teach my children the imperfect truth of what it means to love a forest. Someday I will teach my children that this world is not ours to hold, but that we hold it anyway. That each of us is a steward for one brief and precious moment in time. In our short lives, we must learn to pair power and freedom with humility, to embody relationship and responsibility, even when it breaks our hearts. Someday I will tell my children that despite everything, we are destined to thrive, that we are destined to live in a world that is beautiful. In the years to come, the traces of this moment will fade. This empty patch cut will have become a diverse young forest the stumps softening and mixing with those of the oaks cut decades ago. I will walk through this young forest and remember this autumn day when my hands were young. I will remember that each tall, perfect oak was once an acorn between my fingertips, that this forest is a child of responsibility, something that we could only have embodied together. No one but me will ever truly know the pieces of myself that I've left on this mountain the labor of love that being the steward of this land has been. I will know, and that is enough. We owe too much to the future to be imprisoned by the past. As the storm passes over me, I am grateful to be anything at all, grateful to be alive at a time when there is so much worth saving. I wanna live in the world that will arise from this moment the world built by people who are brave and humble and resilient, who make countless bittersweet compromises, who live their lives with the dream of a better world burning in their chests. I want to live in a world that will be created by people planting acorns in the rain. Sometimes this life feels like autumn, the exhausted end of a boundless summer. Today I choose to live in a world in which spring is just breaking, a world that is just awakening, just beginning to discover what it truly is. I look toward the broken ridge of the mountain and feel a powerful nostalgia, not for the past, but for the future. High above the storm, the light is swelling, calling everything upward toward a world that is just beginning. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ethan. Um, hey, before I forget, what uh what's the best place to send folks to buy the book? Um, 
I would, I always tell people to, um, to go to, you know, you can buy it anywhere. So it's, it's an ebook. It's an audio book. It's a hardcover. Uh, ask for it at your local independent bookstore. Okay. You know, it's at all the big ones, but, um, yeah, support those indies if you can. And, um, yeah. And then it does something where if you ask for it, you know, maybe they'll stock it. And, uh, and then we'll have, and we'll have the book there and ask for it at your library. Cool. Well, Hey, I'll just highlight one item from the chat that I think, uh, resonates for me. I think it's Mr. Mr. Robert Chernow says best program ever, Ethan. Oh, that's, that's, that's nice incredible. Thing, so I would, I would agree, uh, with those, those, that comment. So great job. Thanks for, thanks for, um, reading and, and man, it was, it was excellent. It was excellent. So thanks. Let's uh let's get some of these questions, Rich. Yep, there are a number of them. Uh, there's one from Susan that's both in the chat and in the Q and A. Could you read that one, Andy? Yeah. So this is what she says. Ethan says, "I've read your book, love it. Have given it to many of my like-minded friends. My question for you is: What was the scariest thing you did to your forest that you were not certain what the result would be, but turned out to be very beneficial?" Yeah, I mean, the so there's two. Yeah, maybe I don't know. There's two different things. Um, one thing that I did that um, was interesting was that like, so you don't have beach bark disease in the way that we you have beach leaf disease now. Um, you have a little bit of beach bark disease, but here, basically, beach trees aren't healthy, like, like less than 5% of them are healthy. And we end up in these beach monocultures where they like grow up to a certain size, they get stressed out, they shoot up these clones that also get beach bark disease and deer don't browse them and they all compete all the other stuff and you end up with these monocultures. And so the only way in these areas that were like 100% unhealthy beach trees that would never grow a healthy tree to do that was to bring in these loggers with this bigger equipment, you know, whole tree crews to clear out that whole understory and create these bigger openings in the forest because beach also isn't as competitive in the open. And uh, it was an interesting experience because I had worked with those loggers many times on other people's land. And on my land, I was like, oh, I, this is a big deal. You know, seeing those, that equipment there and stuff like that. Totally still good with doing it, but I, it helped me understand how big of a deal that was. But the thing that was, the, you know, like I said, the hardest to get my head around is this herbicide thing, which is like for a lot of people can't imagine how herbicide could be something that we could use positively, right? And with this 30 acre area, um, you know, it just, I kept on thinking about what could be there. And this is how I think about it, a lot of these things. When I cut a tree, when I, you know, am using, when I'm doing some technique like this is it's not about what we're taking away. It's about what we're creating, you know? And with this forest, I was like, there could be so much more here you know, and not just like the future of that forest, the ability to actually regenerate native species and stuff like that. But I could tell that specifically that area was a place where, you know, there should be growing these spring ephemeral wildflowers that I really like. So like, you must have those, right? Like, uh, you know, ramps, wild leeks, Dutchman's breeches and hepatica and wild ginger and bloodroot, you know, all these cool cut leaf toothwort, like all those cool plants that they grow in these specific kind of sites. And I could tell that this is one of those sites. And um, they also have the, they're just interesting plants. They, they have these really special, specialized relationships with all these insects and specialist insects. And they're like, you know, the Dutchman's breeches, Dicentra. Uh, I read about it in the book that uh, it has this thing called co-emergence with bumblebees. So it's pollinated almost solely by queen bumblebees which when, when bumblebees overwinter, the whole colony dies off and the queen emerges alone to start the colony anew. And it's when she emerges, she emerges at the same time that that Dicentra blooms and they have this cool relationship. So I was like, you know, I wasn't like as much being like, I want to, I hate these plants. I want to get them out of here as much as I was like, you know, I love spring ephemeral wildflowers, you know? And, and so it was about, it was about gen generation and regeneration rather than and taking something away but that's a hard one you know and it's a tough thing too that with these non-native invasive plants like i just haven't seen anybody 
be successful controlling them without herbicide. Um, and it's like, you know, in hundreds of attempts, maybe on a backyard scale, you can do it what we call mechanically. So that's just cutting, you know, cutting them really just doesn't work, but digging them up. Um, but like at scale like this, it's just uh, the success rate is zero. And so we're like, you know, we can do this one gross thing and be really careful about it. And by the way, this is like what every conservation organization does. We we know that we can do it in a way that is not going to impact our soils, our waters, the wildlife communities, the plant communities there long term. We can do it super minimally in a super targeted way. And by doing it, by making that tough decision, give this forest that had no future like another lease on life and make it more diverse and healthy for a century. Um, and for me, that's like, what a small price to pay, pay, you know, and, but then you just go and kill it all and you hope for the best. And, um, and now last spring I went down there and, and found all these spring ephemerals growing on that site right now. And, and then this year, just full of all this like native plant life and regeneration and all this cool stuff. So that was a scary thing I had to do, but now I view that as like being like one of the most radical things that I did. So another question, Ethan, well, I have a question for you. Why Bear Island? There's a couple different reasons. So actually, I'm a little bit worried I'm going to get sued by HBO, but I don't think they're going to come after me. Um, I So the initial name, and it's taken on all these different names, but or all these different like reasons for the name. The initial name came from that show Game of Thrones. It's a place mm -hmm. in Game of Thrones. And I don't know why it stuck, but it just, it was because... I really like black bears and uh, this place, when I came there for the second time, it was like optimum black bear habitat. It was covered in these red pine trees that were bare, you know, signpost trees that they beat up with their claws and they bite and, you know, rub up against networks of caves uh, where these big, big chunks of rock talus crumbled off these cliffs and then jumbled up against and then soil had formed on top of them. And, there's, you know, every winter you can go up there and see those ice crystals on the outlets of there that tells you that stuff's sleeping in there. And uh, yeah, and it was just like a cool, like a bear, op, you know, all these cool stuff they like to eat. Um, just an awesome place for bears. So that's the bear part. And then it, it also feels you're like it goes up against the highway and this busy state road. So it just sort of feels like you're on this little island. So that I think that's why that bear island name stuck. But then I've given it another reason, which is that in the book I talk about right at the end of that wilderness expedition, I had this horrible accident, timber framing, and I got hit in the eye and I went blind in this eye, I remained blind in this eye. And uh, from that, I got this insurance settlement for like a couple hundred thousand dollars. And I traded that, traded my eye for this land, basically. And uh, and so it's also a bare eye land. That's the that's the third reason. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So Andy, if we look at the New Jersey and the challenges that our landowners face, uh, perhaps Ethan, you could tell us, give us some inspiration as to when we, if we have a large property like yours or even a smaller property, sometimes it seems insurmountable mm. to deal with all of these issues. You listed a whole bunch yourself. Yeah. I mean, thirty acres of barberry for most people on this call would be an, an impossible yeah. task what's yeah. the what what inspirational thoughts how do you keep going i know you toss your rock every morning and you yeah. build your pile but uh you know i try to bite things off in very small 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 bites sure and set yeah. my goals really narrow uh how do you go about you know these large challenges yeah when i talk about this um my girlfriend nava has been on a couple i've been on a couple of my events and she's always like uh, when I start to talk about this, she's, she interjects that I'm not a normal person, which is also true. Uh, and I have to give deference to that, that like most people don't just want to spend like all their time and all of their money, you know, and all of their whatever resources working on their land. Um, and so I'm different, but like, if you're willing to use the right tools, like with that barberry, I know exactly how long it took 30 acres of barberry took me 12 days. And, um, so that was, uh basically like two days a week for like a, a good part of the summer you know but you could also split that up across multiple years uh but the but the thing is with that in that exact case like 
you got to use the herbicide, you know, and, and uh, if you're not doing that, you know, you're probably, you're just never going to make a meaningful impact on that. And that's just the, the tough truth of it, right? There is also something that, um, you know, I think also can really expand our capacity, right? Which is, uh, we, we really need to understand, this is something that's really hard to understand. We need to understand uh, that having stuff like markets for wood, you know, timber markets and firewood markets and pulp markets and all these other things, is that can actually be an incredible asset, right, to our ability to manage forests. And I know New, I know New Jersey doesn't have a lot of markets, but we need to see these as them as restoration tools. And the reason for that is because, like, when I want to go into this forest, any forest, you know, we can we can do this management work and we can you know restore these forests and try and create these conditions, you know, ha habitats that are underrepresented across our landscape and do things to make our forests more resilient and you know maybe even to help them be more like old growth forests which I do a lot of in my work. And you know if we're just we got to pay somebody to do that if we can't do it ourselves uh how much can you do? You know, you maybe I don't know, you can do a couple acres or something. Uh you know, maybe you can't do any because you just don't have the means to pay anybody. Uh or you get these cost share funds and they're also limited, you know, get from the NRCS. If you can make that commercial, which you can without compromising those values, and you can have a logger do it, and you can, you know, you're not compromising your values, but you are also producing wood, then suddenly I can do with a single logger, I can do 200 acres of restoration a year with a small logger, you know, and I can, I can scale that work tremendously. And you don't have to, it doesn't have to be every landowner risking their life out there like it, it's it's actually really really something that we need to think about is you know in in places like new jersey that maybe have lost some of those markets or all of those markets redeveloping those so that we can do this kind of work at scale um but yeah for landowners i would say just like you know one one technique that i really like that i think embodies a lot of good things is this technique called crop tree release right which is where you know, the old school way maybe of going into the forest, you go into the forest, you want to help make it healthier. So you just go in there and you start cutting all the unhealthy trees. And the problem is that you never get anywhere, right? And also those unhealthy trees do have some wildlife value sometimes. You don't want them to be like Bear Island where they're just all unhealthy. But um, having some there is good. So what you do instead that that makes your work so much more efficient and that also does the maximum amount of good that you can do, you know, with the limited amount of time that you have is, Instead of looking at all the trees that need to go, you look at all the trees that you really want to grow. You go and do what I did, which is like find those healthy trees that are there. Find that oak tree, you know, find that really special tree and then cut the trees that are competing with them. And if they're not competing with those crop trees, leave them alone and move on to the next crop tree. Right. So that's how that's one way that we can like, you know, we're like, I'm a landowner. I have limited time. And this is what, you know, this is what I'm going to do. You know, and I want to do the maximum amount of good that I can. So I'm going to go find those crop trees, you know, and, and it, it shifts the way you think about it. Because instead of looking at all the stuff that's wrong with your forest, you're looking at all the stuff that's good about that's it, important. you know. And I think that that's, it's a, it's a cool way to think about it. That's something I recommend to landowners all the time. There was a question that just came up, which was, what herbicide did you use? Glyphosate. So glyphosate um, is the one that, you know, it's recommended by the Nature Conservancy, it's it's by far the most environmentally ben benign herbicide that we have access to. It's tricky optically um, because it's also the most widely used herbicide in the world. And it's used in all these other ways that are like, I would argue less, less responsible. And, but that by the way, are completely different, totally different scale, order of magnitude, usage, everything than what we're talking about, which is ultra targeted application to individual plants. But, you know, people are all, you know, they hear these horror stories about it being used in industrial agriculture or whatever, which is totally, totally different. Uh, but yeah, that's the one that we use. Uh, and we use it because it breaks down really quickly. It doesn't bioaccumulate. It doesn't have any soil activity, so it doesn't affect non-target plants through the soil. It bonds very strongly with soil particles. So like 
unless you're spraying it on water, it's not going to leach into water. Those are the reasons why we use it. And do you see any others? I see a question here on planting. Did you do any planting? Yeah, in the last chapter, I was planting acorns, um, which I did because, uh, you know, one of the things that loggers, that the those, you know, unsupervised loggers did 30 years ago is when they cut those big trees, a lot of those big trees were red oak, which is really a species that should be a lot more present on my land than it is. And so it's become, I've become obsessed with oaks, bringing the oaks back. And so what I did is I like, you know, cut all these patch cuts, disease beach, cleaned them right out on an oak seed year. I did it like in August um, in, into early September. And so, and I left all the remaining oak trees that were there. And so there were just acorns on the ground. And if you bury acorns, it's really best to, well, we could talk more about acorn planting if you want, but if you just bury acorns a little bit, uh, it really increases their chance of sprouting because it's very common for every acorn on the surface of the soil to be consumed by stuff. And that actually, like almost all the ones that uh, we, you know, actually become oaks are ones that have been cached by rodents, squirrels and stuff. And interestingly, also as an aside, uh, we used to think that they would forget that squirrels would forget where those eight caches were and that's how we would get acorns. But there is some research that suggests that um, they actually have really good spatial memory and that probably the acorns that make it are ones from squirrels that have been killed by predators, specifically aerial predators. Hmm. So it's just sort of an issue. Yeah, you know, if you don't have good hawk habitat, can't grow any oaks, you know? Hmm. Um, so yeah, so, so I did a bunch of acorn planting. I probably planted, I don't know, 10,000. Just, just with a stick, you know, just taking acorns that were already on the surface of the soil and just plunking them down in there. Um, and I did my best. I mean, it's still like a lot of them didn't make it. You know, you uh, still in those patch cuts, they they regenerated. And the other winter, I walked through them and found every one of those little oaks. And you know, there weren't that many um, that made it because they still then had to deal with like deer deer wanting to seek them out and browse them and stuff like that. Um, but I also, the place where I've really done planting is that I did, I do have a little orchard that I planted, um, but not as much in the woods. Oh, and I planted, I did some chestnuts. I did some, some potential resistant chestnut planting that I actually, that I had protected from deer as well. Andy, do you see anything else in there? Uh, we had a question come in about girdling. So when you're doing these uh, patch cuts or doing thinning, uh, is there any particular reason why you would fell a tree completely versus girdling the tree? Yeah, I mean, so girdling is interesting. I girdle a lot of trees, but um, it depends, like, well, you know, Andy, that, like, it depends on the efficacy of that technique. Like, what we, what we used to think of, like, when we're girdling is that we're trying to create a snag, right, dead standing tree, which is this awesome habitat for wildlife. But we know that like different species of trees, when you girdle them, don't behave the same. Like some of them are good. Some of them just end up falling over the next year. Some of them, you know, they don't die. They'll heal, like heal over that girdle. Um, I've had a lot of trouble girdling red maple. Have you had trouble with that? I feel like mm -hmm. they always, they either survive or they fall over. Yeah, yeah. But like, uh, so, and then the other th interesting thing about girdling is that, there was some research that came out recently that says that actually sometimes when you, it kills them too that it doesn't give them time to develop these really slow developing like internal rot that leads to the creation of the cavities in the dead standing trees that are you know one of the reasons why we really want them as habitat features so that the um you know, habitat for nesting birds and mammals. And, uh, but yeah, so what, what I do now normally is I girdle trees. Um, if they're, usually I do it, it's just faster and safer than felling a tree. And if it's not in a place where it could become a hazard someday, or if it's a tree that's really sketchy, like a big, you know, white pine with tons of different limbs and stuff. And I just can't think of a safe way to put it on the ground. I'll do that. The benefit of felling trees though, 
that I found is that, you know, deadwood on the ground is a really important feature. And sometimes it's nice when you're creating these openings, you can create these like big tangled jumbled messes of trees and treetops and stuff, which does do some something to preclude deer browse. So I found in some areas, if you can make this like huge jumbled mess that you'll find in those areas, uh, these pockets of regeneration, you know, and diversity that you can't find in areas that deer can more easily access. So I like to, I like to fell a lot of trees for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't go crazy on girdling for anybody who's thinking that's a great option, especially if you're going to re-enter that stand on yeah. somewhat of a regular basis. Cause you've just, yeah, you're creating up. hazards. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So we've, we've watched plenty of girdled trees fall. Yeah. Mm hmm so Andy, it's been a great night, a wonderful night. Uh, and you have any other questions for no, Ethan? Thank no. Thank you all. Um, well, uh, follow me. I can't. I can't anymore. thank you enough, Ethan. I can't thank you enough for doing this. I think it's just great that you took the time to share mm. just your innermost feelings with this group here in Jersey. And uh, a lot of the people who care about the forest here feel a little bit isolated and you kind of bring mm. us together. So it's a very nice feeling and we truly appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. And, Anything else um, you want to share, Ethan, as far as Yeah, like... I would just say- oh, um, But before we want... go, before we go, whoop, whoop, Andy? Yeah, that's right. We, we do have to pick a number here. Oh, um, yeah. Um, uh, hey, name of the book. I've heard, I've seen this a couple of times in the chat, everybody. It is- how to love a forest um and i did drop the link in the chat so if you want to if you want to um if you want to order it you can go on the website there ethan anything else on the on links and stuff like that or youtube channel what else yeah just follow me follow me on instagram or tiktok or facebook or i'm under my handle is at how to love a forest on all this cool awesome um, all right, so we're going to do a, a book giveaway. The way this thing works is I'm going to pick a number here in a minute from, uh, I don't know, one. Actually, I'm not going to pick a number. Ethan's going to pick a number between one and, uh, I don't know, one and 25. Don't, don't do anything just yet. Um, but we will need to get your name and mailing address. So don't hop off the call until you provide that for us, probably through uh, – the chat or through the Q and A, if you're the winner. No, don't don't do it that way, no. Andy. Do it by email to you know, NJ, okay. NJ Forestry oh, at gmail NJForestry okay. at gmail .com. That works. Yep, that works for everybody. And um, so go ahead, Andy. Start the right. start the engine. Ethan, one to twenty five. You got a number in mind? You want me to say it out loud? No, no, no. Just keep it to yourself. And if you see it in the chat, you're gonna. Um, you're going to ask people to enter that in the chat, right? Yeah. Andy? Yeah. One to 25 for people like Dylan Berger. 26 doesn't count. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> so find it, Ethan. I don't see it yet. Uh-oh. I don't see it. 22.5. Uh, Very cute. Uh, I, wait, did I see it? Nope. <laughs> Still not there. You're missing one, gang. Wow, that's a lot of numbers up there. Jeez. Yeah, they didn't get it. This is wild. No, no. <laughs> oh, I saw it. I saw it. Can what? I say who got it? Yeah, go yeah. ahead with the number. Make sure we didn't miss one. Yeah. Number nine. Number nine. So is it Steve Maurer? Is that Steve. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to scroll back up and just make sure nobody else did a nine. I think there was a remarkable act of just uh, dodging number nine. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. No. Man, there was a lot of guesses. Whew. Long list. Nope. That was it. You did it, there Steve. So, Steve, okay. shoot an email one more time, Rich. Email njforestry at gmail.com sweet just shoot, shoot me an email and we'll ship you the book very cool Steve good perfect he's got it. all right
Thank you so much, Ethan. Rich, any other things? Thank you, Ethan. Sure. I'm just so appreciative of you doing this today. Thank you. Oh, wait, hold on. Instagram, Instagram handle one more time. Somebody's asking. I don't even know what that means, but go ahead, Ethan. <laughs> uh, Instagram it's handle. At, it's at how to love a forest. Oh, there you go. You got it. Cool. Just like the title of the book. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Ethan. Thank you all. Have a great night. All right.